Well, good Sunday morning, everyone. It is September the 20th, and I am so glad that you've chosen to tune in and join me for Bible study as we continue to take a look at the great book of Proverbs. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you so much for tuning in. Hope that you'll be encouraged by your time with us and want to come back and be with us anytime that you can. So if you've got your Old Testaments and if you've got them open to the book of Proverbs, you're in the right place. Now let's turn to chapter 12. We're going to take a look at chapter 12 today. Hey, keep in mind that beginning in two weeks, that is with the first Sunday in October, this will be presented live at an in-person assembly. We are going to, at uh, beginning in October, Sunday afternoon slash evening, 5 o'clock, I know pre-COVID, we met at 6. Right now, we're going to go to 5 o'clock. I'm so excited about adding an afternoon-evening assembly that we can come together again uh, in addition to our morning service. I'm really excited about that. I know a lot of you are as well. And we're going to use that time for Bible classes. And so I'm going to continue with Proverbs on Sunday and it's going to be, like I said, beginning the first Sunday in October, it's going to be live streamed at 5 o'clock. So what that means is if you try to find this lesson, the Proverbs class, before 5, you won't find it. Tune in live at 5 o'clock. Of course, if you can't tune in at 5, though, don't worry. It will be archived. It will be on our YouTube page. So you'll be able to get to it any time that you want. But... It will be live streamed at 5 o'clock, beginning in two weeks. Can't wait for that. Also can't wait for the fact that on Wednesdays, beginning in October, we're going to have Bible classes again in person here at the building. I'm so excited about that. I'll be doing another class, not on Proverbs. We'll be starting another theme, and that will also be live streamed. For those of you who can't come out or are just not quite comfortable yet getting out into an in-person assembly, and that's okay, uh, but uh, you'll be able to live stream it, and that's going to be at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. But again, that's going to be another topic, not Proverbs. Beginning in October, uh, this will continue to be a Sunday morning only class. Okay, now with all of that out of the way, chapter 12 is where you should be. Proverbs chapter 12, uh, really what we have here in the first couple of verses of Proverbs chapter 12 those verses really go with the last two chapters of chapter 11. And what you have here in chapter 11, verses 30 and 31, and chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, is yet again, and we saw this all through chapter 11, it is a contrast between a violent, undisciplined life and a virtuous life, a righteous life, one that is carried out in submission to God's Word and God's ways. Now, let's just read the last two verses of chapter 11. That is verses 30 and 31. And then we'll read the first two verses of chapter 12. Let's read them all together. The fruit of, righteous, the, fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. If the righteous will be rewarded in the earth... How much more the wicked and the sinner. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. A good man will obtain favor from the Lord, but he will condemn a man who devises evil. And so again, there you see uh, two approaches to life. One approach to life is reckless. Uh, one approach to life is not interested in instruction. Uh, is not interested in knowledge. Uh, that's the person at the end of verse 1 of chapter 12 is described as hating reproof. And that person also is described as the one who hates reproof is stupid. Uh, they're stupid because uh, it's not going to give them any benefit and advantage in life. In fact, all it's going to do is lead to their own destruction. And so that's the consequences and the outcome of this undisciplined life. Whereas, again, you see the wise man is described as one who loves discipline. He loves knowledge. 
He recognizes that he doesn't know everything. He recognizes that God does know everything. He wants the benefit of God's guidance. He wants the benefit of God's wisdom. And when he does that and he surrenders himself to God's ways, it's going to bless him. And again, the interesting thing is not only will it ultimately bless him in eternity, but keep in mind again what verse 31 of chapter 11 said. That is the last verse of chapter 11. It is going to also have uh, benefits. God is also working in the here and now to benefit them. Uh, Look at it again, verse 31. If the righteous will be rewarded in the earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner. God's providence is working. God is intervening in the here and in the now, both in the life of the righteous and the life of the wicked. That is the uh, life of the one who submits to God's ways and the one who rejects God's ways. Okay, verse 3 and 4 of chapter 12. A man will not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous will not be moved. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, But she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. Now what you have here, verses 3 and 4, and I told you this last week as we looked at chapter 11, as we came to the end of the chapter, I told you that verse 3 and 4 of chapter 12 uh, really goes with verses 28 and 29 of chapter 11. Those verses teach that a man cannot provide for the security of his family through any means that violates the basic principles of right and wrong. If you think you are going to provide for a strong family and violate the principles of right and wrong, you are dead wrong. The only way to bless your family is to acknowledge the principles of right and wrong that come from the character and the Word of God and submit to those things, and it will be a blessing to your family. See, take a look at verses 28 and 29 of chapter 11 again. You'll see what I mean. He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. He who troubles his own house will inherit the wind, and the foolish will be servant to the wise-hearted." He who troubles his own house will inherit the wind. This is the man who is trusting in his own riches. He's going to fall in verse 28. Um, This is the person who is just out and about. All that they care about is making as much money as possible. Uh, They are, that's trusting in their riches. Uh, All that matters is, you know, what what the bank account looks like. Uh, It is how much money I'm going to make. It is how powerful am I going to be? It it is that focus, and that focus is going to trouble his house. It's not going to bless his house. So instead of trusting in riches and troubling your household, verse 4 of chapter 12, the best thing that you can do is uh, give thought to the choice of the person that you're going to marry. Wow, for all of those of you out there who aren't married yet, that's good counsel. Verse 4, I know, says an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. I know that's talking about finding an excellent wife, but listen, the principle works both ways. What is going to bring security to your home, what is going to bring joy to your home, what is going to bring stability to your home, what is going to bring soundness of health to your home is not buckets of money. It is going to be a a godly mom and a godly dad conducting life with integrity. That kind of home is set up to succeed. And so if you really want to focus on excelling at life and having a great home to raise your family in, you better focus not so much on how much money you can make, but you better focus on who it is that you're going to be living with and going to be raising your kids with. Uh, that's, uh, That's the message of chapter 11, 28 and 29 and chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. Okay.
Let's take a look at verse 5. Actually, verses 5 through 7. Let's read it together. We'll make some observations. Here we go. The thoughts of the righteous are just, but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright will deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. Okay, what's this all about, verses 5 through 7, as we continue to contrast the righteous life and the wicked life? Uh, Well, these three verses here are all about plans and schemes, making plans with life. And the point that is being made here is that righteous people make just plans, plans that are just. Uh, they, They have integrity and they stand secure. Look at it again. The thoughts of the righteous are just. When you're planning life, when you have a vision for life, when you're watching kind of life and your days stretch before you and you and your spouse are, are, are talking about your plans and your hopes and your dreams, then the plans that you're going to make are just uh, when you're a righteous person. That is, they're going to be consistent with God's character, God's will, and God's ways. Uh, The counsel of the wicked, on the other hand, the end of verse 5, the second part of verse 5, they are scheming with deceitful counsel. Uh, Their plans aren't driven by, um, by justice. And what I mean by justice in this context, again, is plans that are consistent and right. Uh, the, uh, they're, they're trying to get ahead. This is the person who's trying to get ahead, and it doesn't matter how they do it. They just want to get ahead. And if they have to, if they have to play fast and loose with the truth along the way, well, you know, hey, that's the price of success. If they have to step outside of God's boundaries to do it, Morally and ethically, hey, you know, you got to do what you got to do. That, that's this person. And so, uh, they scheme with deceitful counsel. Uh, they uh, aren't afraid. They're not people of integrity. Keep, in fact, keep looking at it. Verse six, the words of the wicked lie in wait for blood. Um, again, that's the picture. That's the image of words damaging people. Uh, uh, obviously, how words damage people are in a, uh, various ways, but ultimately, uh, it connects with the end of verse 5, deceitful. It is all about ambushing uh, the righteous, uh, taking advantage of good people, exploiting them with lies. And so you have these two ways uh, when it comes to plans and schemes. And I, th- I think, let's, let's talk about the righteous just in terms of plans. The unrighteous don't plan, they scheme. So you've got righteous people plan, and they plan with integrity, and they plan with God's ways in mind, and they're going to be blessed. Evil people, they are going to be scheming, whatever they have to do. There's not going to be real integrity there. Um, and so they're going to ultimately be, be destroyed. And that's what verse 7 says. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand Verse 8, take a look at it. A man will be praised according to his insight, but one of perverse mind will be despised. A a man will be praised according to his insight, but one of perverse mind will be despised. That is simply saying that respect is gained by wisdom uh, and by integrity and by the capacity to deal with life. A man will be praised according to his insight. Uh, People will respect you when uh, you demonstrate wisdom, when you demonstrate integrity, uh, when you demonstrate the capacity 
to deal in healthy, godly ways with the problems of life, people will respect you. On the other hand, but one of perverse mind will be despised. There is no respect for the individual whose counsel is all twisted. It's worldly counsel. It's words without wisdom. So real, you want real respect of people, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, be a person of wisdom and you will be respected. Okay, verses 9 through 11. This is about providing for one's needs. Let's read these three verses. Better is he who is lightly esteemed and has a servant than he who honors himself and lacks bread. A righteous man has regard for the life of his animal, but even the compassion of the wicked is cruel. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who pursues worthless things lacks sense. Okay, let's look at these three verses. Like I said, these are all verses about providing for one's needs. Verse 11 is about, it's telling us uh, the fact that modest prosperity is more important than status. Modest prosperity is more important. This, uh, look at it again, verse 9. Better is he who is lightly esteemed and has a servant. Okay, you don't have a lot of status. You're lightly esteemed. You know, everybody doesn't know your name. You're not one of the power brokers, but you have a servant. That, that, that suggests, that language there suggests modest prosperity. You have a servant, a servant. Uh, so better is, in other words, again, uh, being modestly prosperous, uh, it, it is more important than status, than he who honors himself and lacks bread. Uh, status, uh, you know, everybody can know your name and everybody can, you know, pat you on the back and invite you to your party, but if you don't have any kind of prosperity, life's going to be tough. Modest prosperity is better than status. It's amazing, though. I think a lot of people would trade status for even modest prosperity. You know, people like to be liked, and people like to be wanted, and what people will give up for things like that. But it's better to have something, uh, even modest prosperity, than status and have nothing. Uh, verse 10, uh, the idea here, a righteous man has regard for the life of even his animal, but even the compassion of the wicked is cruel. Uh, that is, a good man, a good person, a righteous person, uh, cares for those who provide for him. Here the picture is one of, he, he, even if it's only animals, they always make sure that, uh, that their animals are well taken care of. Uh, they're, they're, they're properly fed, they're properly sheltered. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this animal is contributing to my well-being and I will care for him. That's what a good person does. Uh, the wicked person, on the other hand, all they do is exploit. That's all they, they do. That's why the second part says, but even the compassion of the wicked is cruel. Uh, when a wicked person is showing compassion, uh, it, it's, it's driven usually by uh, the desire to exploit something for their own benefit. It's manipulation. And so you want to be a good person, then you don't exploit. You care for those who provide for him. And, you know, it's even talking about here on the animal level, but that's even on, of course, that principle extends to if you're a boss, you're a business owner, you have employees who work under you, uh, a good man, a righteous man, a man of principle, uh, you're going to really take care of those people who take care of you. It's not going to be about exploiting them just for your own benefit. That's what wicked people do. It, you're going to be satisfied with a reasonable return, and you're going to make sure that they are well taken care of as well. Okay, and then we finally get to verse 11. Uh, again, here under this heading, verses 9 through 11, uh, providing for one's needs. Verse 11, he who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who pursues worthless uh, things lacks sense. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Prosperity comes by hard work. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread. While the writer of Proverbs has a lot to say about hard work. You can't escape. That is one of the things that God built into life. If you want to, ex if you want to excel and if you want to have plenty of bread, you have got to work hard. There is no other way to do it than that. Um, 
the, the person who pursues worthless things lacks sense. This is the person who is, who is chasing fantasies and he's chasing, chasing schemes. And if he would stop chasing fantasies and if he would stop chasing schemes and work hard, then he would have plenty. Okay, verses 12 through 14. This is, um, this is a chapter, or, or this is a section here. Let's just read these verses, then we'll make some observations here. Uh, the wicked man desires the booty of evil men, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. An evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will escape from trouble. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his words, and the deeds of a man's hands will return to him. Okay, so this is all about fruit and snares. Uh, Twice you've seen this reference to fruit here. Uh, And again, it's basically what I just said uh, a minute ago. It's kind of an expansion of what we saw there in verses 9 through 11, and that is the wicked are always looking to defraud. That's they're always looking to exploit people for their own advantage. They're always wanting to take advantage to, of people. That's why it says in verse 12, the wicked man desires the booty of evil men. That's, that's what they care about. Uh, but they're, they're trapped by their own tactics here. That's what verse 13, an evil man is ensnared by the transgression of, of, of his own lips there. Uh, they're, they're trapped by their own tactics. Uh, it's going to, in other words, if that is the course they pursue, it's going to be ultimately to their own detriment and destruction. But the righteous person uh, allows their prosperity to grow gradually uh, from deep and strong roots. Look at verse 12 again. The root of the righteous yields fruit. Look, roots don't happen overnight. Uh, roots gradually grow. And it's the root of righteous people that eventually yields fruit. And not only that, escapes uh, the snares that are set for them. Look at the end of verse 13, but the righteous will escape from trouble. People that are righteous who uh, seek to honor God's uh, uh, sovereignty and His will in their life and who are open to discipline and counsel and wisdom, uh, they are they are astute. To the ways of the wicked, and uh, and they will uh, they will be protected uh, when others won't be protected, uh, and 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 their their life is going to yield a beautiful harvest. So look at verse fourteen: a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his words, and the deeds of a man's hands will return to him. It'll be a good good life. Okay, very quickly, we got to move on a little bit here. Uh, Verse 15, I love verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. That is really simple. Wise people are able to take advice. Wise people are able to take advice. And uh, those who think, on the contrary, uh, the second part, but a wise man, or or, uh, 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 in contrast to that, thank you very much, what I'm looking for, uh, those who think they know it all are foolish they don't look for guidance, and uh, it's going to be their own detriment. But here, um, a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Uh, verses 16 through 22 is all about the use and the abuse of words. Let's read those verses. A fool's anger is known at once, but a prudent man conceals dishonor. He who speaks truth tells what is right, but a false witness deceit. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. No harm, verse 21, befalls the righteous, but the wicked are filled with trouble. There you go. The characteristics of fools is described in this text here. And let's just kind of look at them real quick again. Uh, A fool's anger is known at once, verse 16 says. That is, they react thoughtlessly. You see, a prudent man conceals his dishonor. That is, he's patient with insults. Uh, The foolish man is going to react thoughtlessly to insults, whether they're real insults or whether they're imagined insults, 
And he's going to hurt others with careless words. That's what that means. Um, they are liars, fools. Uh, are, are, they, they lie. Um, the, the verse 19, you'll see the end of that. Uh, not only verse 19, but in verse 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But there in verse 19, a lying tongue is only for a moment. Uh, the wicked are, are people without integrity and they're going to last only a short time. They're going to incur the wrath of God. Uh, again, we see the same thing here. They scheme and deceive and they only bring trouble on themselves. Uh, it's just the choices that they make are going to be painful to them. The wise, on the other hand, he emphasizes, as I said, they react with patience to insults. And what they do is they heal with their words. They don't hurt, uh, they don't hurt with their words. Look at verse 18. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword. People who don't think before they speak, it's like jabbing someone with a sword. They inflict pain. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Wise people bring healing with their words. They're honest and they gain long life and they gain favor. Uh, they seek the well-being of others as well as the well-being of themselves. They're not just consumed with themselves. That's what verses 16 through 22 is all about. Okay, verses 23 through 28, the last little section here in verse 12, is about a wholesome life. Um, uh, there's not really any central theme in this section, but they... This section really what it does is it describes the activities that can promote promote a wholesome life or undermine a wholesome life. life. Let's look at it real quickly. Let's read verses 23 through 28. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims folly. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the slack hand will be put to forced labor. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. The righteous is a guide to his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. A lazy man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. In the way of righteous is life, and in its pathway there is no death. Okay, so what are some of these activities? Like I said, there is no one central theme in this section, but it describes the types of activities that either promote a wholesome life or undermine a wholesome life. Well, the activities that will promote a wholesome, healthy life are, first of all, being cautious in your speech, just like we saw there in verses 16 through 22. Uh, look at verse 23. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims folly. You're just cautious. A prudent man conceals knowledge. You're just cautious with your words. You don't just blurt things out. You're cautious with your words. That's going to lead to a wholesome life. A second thing that leads to a wholesome life is you're going to choose your friends wisely. Look at verse 26. The righteous is a guide to his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Uh, choose your friends wisely. The wicked will lead you astray. The righteous will be a blessing to you and guide you in the right way. Uh, if you want a wholesome life, choose your friends wisely. Another thing that will set you up for a great life is, yep, here it is again, verse 24, work hard. Verse 24, the hand of the diligent will rule but the slack hand will be put to forced labor. And the last thing that will help you in a, live a wholesome life, a productive life, is verse 25, control stress. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. And of course, the outcome of righteousness is immortality. Verse 28, in the way of righteousness is life. And obviously here, ultimately, that's talking about eternal life. Hey, look at verse 27 real quick as we end this lesson today. I love this little proverb, a lazy man does not roast its prey, his prey. Um, I think there's a little humor that's intended there. Uh, it shows the epitome of laziness. You can't get more lazy than this. You go to the trouble of hunting game 
Going hunting because you're hungry, but you're just too lazy to get around to preparing it. Now that is a lazy person, and so it goes to waste. Uh, okay, so more contrast between the upright and the wicked. Thanks for joining me today for Bible study. Tune in next week as we continue to take a look at this book of Proverbs. Chapter 13 is where we'll pick up next week. In the meantime, take care and God bless.